when the first time you hear the word firewall, this is something that might come into your mind. A hacker actually trying to infiltrate your network and you're blocking it by writing some rules in a service called a firewall. And I want you to keep that thing in your mind that is you write some rules that allow or block someone or something or a IP or a port to be accessible from the outside world. And that's how you keep your network secure. Or it could be one of the ways you keep it secure. But what exactly is a firewall? So let's understand that. So let's imagine a real world scenario. Here is your office space that we work. And these are the four members who have some work at the office. John, David, Amanda are the employees of the office. And worker A that you see here is here to fix the plumbing in the cafeteria. Among these four people, who do you think should have access to the development business unit of the office? Obviously, three members who have the access and they are John, David and Amanda. But to make that decision, we have a security system in place that allows only the employees to enter the development business unit. So we have three people who have the access and one who does not. When they reach the office, this is what their access looks like. So as you can clearly see, three members, John, David and Amanda have the access and they are allowed to the business unit of development and worker A is restricted. Now it's time to leave the office. So everyone has to leave to their respective homes. But if you have noticed, the office security will not allow you to take anything out of the office other than your laptop and personal items. And those things that the office person or the security personnel will not let you take out are the office bonded warehouse items. Here as well, we have a security system which blocks users from going out if they carry any bonded items. Okay, so bonded items are like chair, tables and other office items. So don't think about that. But you have to remember that when you're stepping out of the office, the security system does not allow you to move out if you carry if you carry with yourself any office bonded warehouse item. Now keep these two scenarios in mind. One, where we are allowing or restricting people coming inside the office. And the second one is where we restrict or allow people outside of the office based on certain conditions. And the first one is called the inbound rule, which restricts the access for people coming inside the office. And the second one is what we call as an outbound rule, which restricts or allows access to people going outside the office. Remember these two terms very carefully, inbound and outbound, and the way the security restricted access for them. Those are rightly called the rules or access rules. So the three things that you need to remember here are inbound rules. The second one is outbound rules. And the third thing is access rules. Okay, let's come back to the networking world. Here you see two things. One is your local area network where you have your devices or servers that you host applications with or you are working with. And we have the wide area network or what you call your internet space from which the requests are being sent and propagated across the globe. The most important thing for you to remember is that security to your network is imperative. And you can secure it enough by restricting access to people whom you think are good enough to access your resources. And a firewall can help you do that. So I'll ask you once again, what is a firewall? So a firewall could be a software that is installed on your machine, or it could be hardware that sits in between the device or network that you are a part of and the actual uplink or the internet, which carefully analyzes the traffic and allows or restricts the flow of traffic to your device or devices with the help of a predefined configuration rule that is written to the firewall. So I'll tell you this once again, a firewall could be a software that is installed on your machine or it could be a hardware that sits in between the device or network that you are a part of and the actual uplink or the internet which carefully analyzes the traffic and allows or restricts the flow of traffic to your device or devices with the help of predefined configuration rule that 
are written to the firewall like what we saw before let's suppose your device ip is 32.68.11.23 and the port is 22 we can write a rule that allows a different ip 40.12.22.12 to access this ip address with a particular port I am not sure how many of you have worked with IP tables, but if you have, you know what I am talking about here. But we are not going to discuss in depth on how to configure firewalls, but you need to understand the basics before moving forward. And not everyone who is on the internet is good. There are people who are bad and they want to access your content which is unethical. They could be the hackers or spammers or those can be bots who just repeatedly try and manipulate or access the data which is very bad for your network. So with a firewall, you can allow requests that you feel are good and valid and that will help you block other unwanted people from accessing your network and you can do that by configuring predefined rules in your firewall itself. Remember this point very carefully. So with a firewall, you can allow requests that you feel are good and valid and that will help you block other unwanted people from accessing your network and you can do that by configuring predefined rules in firewall itself. So you can do that by configuring predefined rule sets in your firewall itself. But that's what makes the firewall special. As I already told you before, there could be both good and bad requests let's see what happens when a firewall handles the traffic so if you see here the bad requests basically just bounce off from the firewall and the good ones are able to reach the destination that is your network but how does a firewall determine if a request is from a good or bad source just before understanding how that exactly works let's see a few types of firewalls so the first one is host based firewall the simple meaning of host with respect to network is that a host is a machine or a device that is a part of the network. And host based actually means that the firewall resides within the host itself. So how it can reside inside a host? Obviously it will be installed on the host itself and you can manage the firewall settings within the host itself. And it will protect the host and its network so that it doesn't get affected by the unwanted traffic or virus attacks or infiltration. So in the definition, the host-based firewall is software that runs on the host machine and protects it from the outside attack. But the thing is that these firewall softwares are very compact and they are for individual devices. If you see here, the firewalls bounce off the bad requests and allow the good ones, which are as per the required rules written on the firewall. So now let's see another firewall that is a bit more robust. Yes, let's talk about network-based firewall. So a network based firewall or network firewall rightly controls the traffic coming in and going out of the network. But the main difference is that it is a dedicated piece of device or system that can help you track, monitor and log the traffic that flows in and out of the network. So it's a dedicated server that sits between your network and the outside world. And as we see here, the device are connected to the network firewall. So the rules that are present on the network firewall precedes the security protocols of the device. But having said that, you can also install an individual host based firewall on your device to have granular controls. So just to reiterate on this once again, if you see the firewall just sits in between the network that you have and the outside world and the bad request just bounce off from the firewall itself but if suppose you want to have granular controls you can also install a host based firewall on your device itself now that the most popular ones are out let's talk about a few more so the first one that we have here is network segmentation firewall so when you think of a network segmentation so the first thing that you want to imagine is a bigger network and when we use this word segmentation it means that we are going to divide this bigger network into smaller segments or maybe breaking it down to the individual device host as well. So in order to do this, we can make use of a hardware firewall which helps you segment the network on the host itself without having to touch the actual network. So these are called network segmentation firewall. They actually help you break down a bigger network into smaller networks or it can break down to an individual host also so that you don't have to really touch the network but you can 
configure rules on the firewall that interpret that this network has been segmented into a separate part and that is why they are called as network segmentation firewall the second one is database firewall so no points for guessing a database firewall is a type of web application firewall that actually helps you monitor databases so that you can identify and protect your databases against database specific attacks so next one is cloud-based firewall okay this is very simple to remember so the cloud-based firewall is a firewall that's installed or hosted on the cloud itself and don't ask me what does installing on cloud means i now think that everyone will be aware of compute as a service or just like we have like computer as a service we here have firewall as a service but these are installed on third party providers and the objective is very simple they help us block malicious traffic and prevent unauthorized access to the private networks i'm not sure but if your organization uses zscaler uh, that's one of the popular cloud firewalls uh, and last but not the least the next gen firewall according to wikipedia what we have here is a next gen firewall is a part of the third generation of firewall technology combining a traditional firewall with other network device filtering functions such as an application firewall using inline deep packet inspection and intrusion prevention system so network filtering is like controlling access to the network by analyzing the incoming and outgoing packets based on the ip address of the source and the destination so this is a combination of multiple features in one firewall that is why it is called as a next gen firewall i'm not going deep into all of these because these are not that much required for our session but i just wanted to share these details with you so that you get to know more than what exactly is being taught outside and these are some of the best known firewalls for windows and linux the first one obviously we have the windows firewall control second one is syscate personal firewall we have zone alarm we have komodo firewall and we also have a very popular one that we have it's like uh, recently they have launched a new version for this one as well that is glasswire and if you like any firewalls in particular please put them in the comment section below when we think of the basic definition of firewall we know that a firewall is a network security system that monitors and controls the incoming and outgoing network traffic based on predetermined security rules so what are those rules so let's take access control list as the primary set of rules so as we already know that the firewall blocks things that you don't want and allows only the ones that you add as a part of the traffic here you see four rules rule one that we have here is having the source ip address so source ip as you know is the source of the request the ip address of the source of the request so the rule one states that if the source ip is 12.12.41.1 and if the protocol is http then you can allow it and rule two and three that you have are denying any source ip that is 32.12.12.1 and 43.11.22.1 having protocol tcp and udp so you just deny those requests and the fourth one is allow for http for 12.122.21.22 so now that you can see here we have to allow rules and we have to deny rules but we are not able to visualize it and you are not able to see but let us see and let us visualize how it would look in a real time scenario when this is being handled by a firewall and these settings are being configured to a firewall see here that based on the rules it either allows or denies the entry of the request from the source ip that was mentioned in the access control list so if you see the firewall is blocking 32.112.12.1 and 43.11.22.1 and allowing 12.12.41.1 and 12.112 sorry 122.21.22 so these are the two rules the rule 1 and rule 4 are being allowed and rule 3 and rule 2 are being blocked but what happens if we are not using any simple firewall what if it is a web application firewall let's check that out so the most important thing that you need to remember when it comes to web application firewall is that you need protection for your web application it might sound stupid but that's a fact the web application firewall is a specific form of application firewall that filters monitors and blocks http traffic 
to and from a web service. So just like we have rules for IP and port in access control list for a web application, it's more granular. As you can see here, we have a good request that is a valid HTTP HTTPS request that is allowed by the firewall and the other invalid cross site scripting and SQL injection requests are being blocked. And the best thing is you can block any request that you might feel is not good as per the common vulnerability exposure data that you get from the OWASP website. So before moving forward, I just want to reiterate on this once again, a web application firewall is a specific form of application firewall that filters, monitors and blocks HTTP traffic to and from a web service. But keeping everything aside, this is what we will discuss from now on. And that's what is important for us in our session today. And that's why we have our own AWS web application firewall. So finally, it's time for us to realign ourselves and think on the lines of AWS Firewall Service for web applications. So AWS WAF is a web application firewall that helps protect your web applications or APIs against common web exploits that may affect availability, compromise security, or consume excessive resources. So you might ask me, if WAF or Web Application Firewall is protecting our applications against common web exploits, what could be these common web exploits? So let's talk about some of these most important exploits. So these are from the top 10 exploits in OWASP or OWASP website. You can check it out as well. So the first one is cross-site scripting or XSS. Here you insert malicious script which acts as a proper request so that you can manipulate the object model and the APIs to execute malicious code. And XSS or uh, cross-site scripting attacks occur when an attacker uses a web application to send malicious code, generally in the form of a browser-side scripting to a different end user. And the next one that we have here is a SQL injection. So this happens when the injection occurs, when an attacker exploits insecure code. Remember that it's the insecure code that is a problem here to insert or inject their own code into a program. So next one is cookie poisoning. This is quite simple. In cookie poisoning, you being an attacker, modify a cookie to gain unauthorized access or unauthorized information about the user for purposes such as identity theft. And the next one is also a very important one, unvalidated inputs. That is the fourth one. So this is very important because every application must be having a form or text input. And if they are not validated properly, and if the data that anyone enters isn't made sure that it is reasonable, it could lead to severe attacks. And the fifth one is layer 7 denial of service. Denial of service is most common attack where the attacker actually overwhelms the server with a huge amount of traffic at once for a period of time, making the service unusable. And the last one is web scrapping. And here, some of you may say that, yeah, extracting data from a website is ethical, but not if you don't have permission to do that. So if the application provisions API to do that with a developer token, you are authorized to do that. But if not, you are not supposed to. You can steal useful information from the website and it won't be ethical. That is why it is one of the most common vulnerabilities and one of the most important vulnerabilities that is web scraping. Just like what we discussed before, AWS WAF gives you control over how traffic reaches your application by enabling you to create security rules that block common attack patterns such as SQL injection or cross-site scripting and rules that filter out and rules that filter out specific traffic patterns you define. That is the reason why I wanted to tell you that what these exploits mean so that you have a better idea when you start off with AWS WAF. So AWS WAF is a web application firewall and by now you know what a web application firewall does. So I think you are at a good place to move forward. Here we can create our rules which can filter out common vulnerability exploits and it can protect your web applications or your network from these attacks or hackers or attackers. So you might be thinking we use NACLs and security groups as well. So what does it make a difference? But I'm sure you guys are smart enough to understand that we aren't just restricting IPs or CIDRs. We are making choices of what kind of HTTP or HTTPS requests have to be blocked. The task for today is to write in the comment section below on what according to you are the differences between WAF and other network access control lists and security groups. So please make sure that you write your points on the comment section about what do you think are the differences between them. When you talk about the money and the pricing that it comes with, 
as AWS has always smartly said, you pay for what you use. It's the same here as well. So the pricing is based on how many rules you deploy and how many web requests your application receives. And there are no upfront commitments. That's great in a way, but it depends on how much popular your website is. <laughs> and when it comes to the important part of the integration of a web with other applications, you can make use of it with Amazon CloudFront as a part of your CDN solution and the application load balancer that fronts your web server or origin server using or that is running on EC2 and Amazon API Gateway for your request APIs or REST APIs or as well you can use AWS AppSync for your GraphQL APIs. So try integrating it with load balancers with API Gateway and a CDN for the propagation. So that is one architecture that is most widely used. So you can use the web application firewall with the load balancers and the application itself being propagated using the CDN and the REST APIs that you have are governed by API gateways. That model also you can use. So now let's talk more about what a WAF can do and how it can do it. Just focus on the image here and don't get too much worried about all the entities here. So here we have the firewall manager which is a security management service that allows you to centrally configure and manage firewall rules across your accounts and application in AWS organizations. So just remember this for now that if you're working in a bigger organization, you are not in charge of a single firewall. There might be hundreds and thousands of firewalls that needs management and for the same purpose, like updating rules or security updates and customization, we need a service which can help us centrally manage all the firewalls under one roof. And for that, we need a firewall manager. And while adding new applications, you can add them to the group with the standards that you have rather than having to configure again newly. Imagine we are taking one of the firewalls that is our AWS WAF. And as I told you, you can make use of AWS CloudFront as a CDN, the load balancer or API gateway. And the first thing that we do is to create the policy. So here you can create your policy using the policy builder or you can create it using JSON or even you can use third party policies listed in the AWS marketplace and make use of them. And the second one is block and filter. As I already said, uh, you can filter out the common exploits using WAF such as SQL injection, cross-site scripting and others and you can block the request based on IP as well. So there are two ways you can do things here. And the other thing that we have that is very important that is to monitor when it comes to monitoring, as expected, you can make use of Amazon to gather metrics and logs and you can streamline them using Amazon Kinesis Firehose as well. And that actually sounds interesting, isn't it? So I spoke a bit about Firewall Manager and I know you want to learn more about it. So let's do that now. So, but before moving forward, just remember these three points very carefully. So you create a policy, then you make the configurations to block and filter and then you monitor. So these three things are very important because that is the wholesome idea of how a application firewall in AWS works. Now let's dig deep inside the AWS firewall manager. So as I already told you before, if you're working in a bigger organization, you are not just in charge of a single firewall. There might be hundreds and thousands of firewall that needs management. And for the same purpose, like updating rules, security updates and customization, we need a service which can help us centrally manage all the firewalls under one roof. And for that, we need a firewall manager. But we need a firewall manager sounds good, but how we can make use of it? So with AWS organizations, I am not sure how many of you use it, but we will be discussing about this as well. It is a very interesting concept. So with AWS organizations, you can enable or enforce security policies. And by using enable all features in AWS organization, you can control how the policies are implemented across all the accounts under the hierarchy. And in the background, it makes use of AWS config. And for that, you must enable AWS config for all the accounts in your organization so that AWS firewall manager can detect newly created resources. So you have your AWS organizations and you have to configure AWS config in all the accounts that you have so that AWS firewall manager can detect any new resource that has been added. So the security policies can be added to that. So once you have your resources and your policies ready, you can make use of the AWS uh, firewall manager uh, so that you can easily roll out AWS WAF rules 
or even enable security groups for your EC2 instances and Elastic Network interfaces or any resource type that you have for your VPC. And these managed rules that you create can propagate across the resources that account has. And in this way, all the resources which are a part of these accounts under your organization will have consistency in policies that you want to apply. So here, if you see, we have the AWS organizations and let's suppose I want to have the configurations for all the resources that we have in the AWS config from which the AWS firewall manager will detect any new resource that has been added or all the existing resources and this WAF policy that you have will be provided to the managed rule set that you have for the WAF here. This is your WAF and this is what is the web application firewall and this is just one firewall. There can be like hundreds of firewalls within the firewall manager and this one will be propagating across the accounts and this will protect and all these managed rules will be applied to the resources that we have for these accounts. So if you are feeling like there are four accounts that might be hundreds of resources under one account, just imagine that this is just a diagram or a basic architecture of how it looks like. But there can be like multiple firewalls that can act uh, under a single firewall manager under a single account as well. So don't think it in such an in-depth way. Just think about in a high level uh, so that you don't get confused. So the most important part here is AWS organization because, because with the AWS enable all feature, you can enable security policies or configurations in a single click across all the accounts that are a part of that particular organization. And that's the one of the beauties of using AWS organizations. And remember one thing that is very important and it is one of the very important prerequisites that here you need an AWS administrator account. So you must assign one of the AWS accounts in your organization at the as the administrator for firewall manager, which will give it full access and account permission to deploy AWS WAF or the firewall itself rules across the organization. And that's how a firewall manager can be very, very important for your design because you can manage a lot of firewalls with the firewall manager and you don't have to individually configure rules or you don't have to individually manage rules in the firewalls. You can just do once in the firewall manager and it will be propagated across all the uh, web application firewalls that you have. So now let's come back to AWS WAF. So by this point, we have understood a lot of things, but still we need to understand more so that we can get a hang of it. And if you're new, I welcome you. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. These slides and presentations take a long time to make. Please support me by hitting the like button and also sharing it with your friends so that they can also get the share of data that you have. And AWS WAF is a web application firewall. I have said this for the hundredth time now, which lets you monitor your HTTP or HTTPS requests, which are forwarded to the CDN or Amazon API Gateway REST API or an application load balancer or an AWS AppSync GraphQL API. And you can also see this in the architecture as well. And there are a few more pointers that are mentioned here. We'll also discuss them. So now let's come back to the design here. Our main goal is to protect the web application that we have, isn't it? So we need to block the invalid request and only allow the valid ones so that our application is protected against hackers and attackers. So when you get a request to be considered, AWS WAF lets you choose one of the following behaviors. The first one is allow all requests except the ones that you specify. Pay attention to this because this is really important. So when you get a request to be considered, AWS WAF lets you choose one of the following behaviors. So the first one that I've told you here is allow all requests except the ones you specify. So here you're allowing the acceptable requests that you have based on the application that you have using CloudFront or AWS API Gateway, but also you want to restrict unwanted requests from the attackers or exploits. So allow all requests except the ones that you specify. So second one is block all requests except the ones that you specify. So this is more like allowing people so this is more like allowing people who have access to the restricted website, like let's suppose the CIDR block IPs should be allowed so that you can allow these CIDR block IPs and the IP range of that CIDR will have access to the website. So you will block all requests except the ones that you specify. So if you have specified something that only will be allowed and others will be blocked rather than what you have in the first condition that is allow all requests except the 
ones that you specify and third one is count the request that matches the property that you specify so this is a tricky but important one so let's suppose your website goes for a change and a new set of properties are being added to the request metadata so instead of allowing or blocking all the requests you can as well count the properties in the request using aws WAF so that you don't have to provide restrictions based on the application itself so post which once you have configured the correct number of properties you can switch the behavior to allow or block so there are three things here allow all requests except the ones that you specify block all requests except the ones that you specify and the third one is count the requests that match the property that you specify so first one allow all requests except the ones that you specify it means that you are writing deny rules here and the second one block all requests except the ones that you specify so it means you are only providing allow requests here and the third one is you count the request metadata or the properties uh, so once you have done this post which with the cdn it gets propagated to the load balancer and the allowed request reaches the website or the web application so it's as simple as it can get let's move on so now let's talk about some of the benefits of using web application firewall manager so we all know by now what an aws WAF manager can do and what exactly it is capable of so aws WAF manager is a service that allows you to centrally configure and manage firewall rules across your accounts and applications in aws organizations that is what you see here isn't it so but if you want to focus on the right hand side and the points mentioned there from a to f all these can be easily configured using the firewall manager just once so that you can make use of it when you associate a new resource so dns firewall rule groups if you have used route 53 you know there is a dns firewall rule group that you can define uh, that's the dns firewall behavior for your vpc so using waf and aws organizations you can enable it as well similarly you can configure network firewalls aws vpc security groups shield advanced protection which we will discuss later and obviously aws WAF firewall rules and policies and the firewall manager also provides centralized monitoring of ddos attacks or distributed denial of service attacks across your organization and there are a lot of things that the firewall manager can do but for now this is enough so i want to reiterate it once again so if you want to focus on the right hand side and the points mentioned here from a to f all these can be easily configured using firewall manager just once so that you can make use of it when you associate a new resource so all these points that you see here from a to f all these can be configured using the firewall manager so now let's see some of the benefits of using aws WAF. so that was the benefits of manager now we will see about the benefits of using aws web application firewall the first one is protection against web attacks as we know we can actually create filters and allow or block any part of the web request it can be your ip address or http header or http body or even uri strings like query parameters or strings so this way you can get the benefit of or you can get the benefit to block common attack patterns such as SQL injection or cross-site scripting. The second one that we have is improved web traffic visibility. So with AWS WAF, you can have integration with CloudWatch to capture logs and create metrics based on the data that you receive. In that way, AWS WAF gives you near real-time visibility into your web traffic. You get comprehensive logging by capturing each inspected web traffic or web request full header data and that can be used in security information analytics or auditing purposes well done aws WAF. <laughs> uh, third one that we have here save time with managed rules so as per aws managed rules for aws web application firewall are a set of rules written curated and managed by the aws marketplace sellers that can be easily deployed in front of your web applications running on amazon cloudfront or aws application load balancers or amazon api gateway so I told you before about most common vulnerabilities using OWASP. So these exploits are created based on the information that third party gets from these websites. So next up is ease of deployment and maintenance. Yes, this is a managed service. So obviously it will be very easy to be deployed. So cause you can deploy it on the CDN using CloudFront or Load Balancer and API Gateway for REST APIs. And there is no need for you to have additional software to deploy AWS WAF and there's no separate DNS configuration needed or SSL TSL certificates to manage or a need for a reverse proxy setup. The last one that we have here is security integrated. 
security is important but it's most important for the people in charge of security to make use of the security or the service in place so waf actually allows your devops team to define application specific rules that increase web security as they develop applications and this is done in stages and they can be placed or they can place web security protocols at multiple points in the development process chain uh, like it can be like development testing deployment and production as well so from the hands of the developers initially writing the code to the devops engineers deploying the software to the security administrators enforcing a set of rules across the organization all these can be done using WAF. so a lot of benefits for this service so make sure you check this out so now let's talk about how does aws WAF work so when you're working with WAF, you need to keep in mind about three things and they are very important so the first thing is web acl so just like we have network acls we have web acls as well in WAF. And ACL, as you know, means access control list. It, me it is meant to provide you a placeholder for your list of rules that you want to either allow or block access for and to the application that you have deployed. But web ACLs, unlike network access control list, provide you more than what you can get with the network access control list because you can also provide rules for HTTP or HTTPS specific request. Now that we have the web ACLs or the web access control list, what is the next thing that we need? Yes, the rules themselves. As it's mentioned here, each rule contains a statement that defines the inspection criteria. So let's suppose you want to block a specific request or IP or a count of request parameters. So you can do that here. And then you provide an action to it. Uh, if the web request meets the criteria, when a web request meets the criteria, that's a match. That depends on how or that depends on you if it is a bad request or a good request. So the most important thing for you to remember is that WAF does not have a mind of its own. You make the choice of putting requests in either allow or block depending on your requirement and the vulnerability exposure. Now that we have the rule, let's move on to the rule groups. So let's suppose you want to have a combination of rules and to form a rule set, you can do that as well uh, for using it later on. So when you work with WAF, remember these three things these three things are really important so you might have to configure web acls and rules and rule groups so these three things are very important on how an aws waf actually works so we have discussed about managed rules before so now let's understand what a managed rule is so other than the rules that we write or policies that we have we can also make use of the managed rules so these managed rules are a set of rules written curated and managed by the aws marketplace sellers i have told you this Okay, so the AWS marketplace enables qualified partners to market and sell their softwares to AWS customers. So AWS marketplace is an online software store that helps customers find, buy and immediately start using the software and services that run on AWS. That's very good and very, uh, what do you say, this is one of the biggest advantages of using AWS because they have AWS marketplace where you can also sell your software if they are, if you are qualified enough as a partner. And along with them, you can also find the managed rules as well. And these managed rules can be deployed in front of your web applications running on AWS CloudFront, application load balancer or Amazon API Gateway. So if you're starting a new project and you are planning to deploy an application, then it's very good to just go with the managed rules and protecting your applications against the most common exploits. So you can make use of this because it is very easy to just get the most important ones from the marketplace and use it in your rule set so that you are protected against the most common exploits. And I have mentioned the top 10 OWASP security risks. So we have injection or say SQL injection here, broken authentication, we have sensitive data exposure, we have broken access control, we have security misconfiguration, we have cross-site scripting or XSS, or we have insufficient logging and monitoring, we have insecure deserialization, or using components with known vulnerability, or and the last one that we have here is XML external entities, that is XXE. And I don't want to go over all of these as you can get the details for them on Google and you can read more about them. But just that you know, you can protect your application with managed rules as well. So this is also very important. Along with the custom rules that you write, you can also get the managed rules from the AWS marketplace sellers. So now that you have web ACLs, rules and rule groups and managed rules. So let's see how we can configure WAF. So this is pretty simple. First, to set up the AWS Web Application Firewall, 
The first thing is that we create a web access control list or web ACL as I already told you. Then you choose the AWS resources that you want AWS WAF to inspect web requests for like you have your CloudFront or Load Balancer of GraphQL APIs. Next you add the rules and rule groups that you want to use as a filter for your web request. Then you assign an action. So you specify a default action for a web ACL either block or allow as I showed you before and the design that you see here as well. And then you wait for the application to receive the request when it comes and you can just relax and enjoy the benefits of AWS WAF. Other than all these features, there is something that you would be really interested in. So let's talk about that. Yes, this is something new, but AWS WAF bot control, the word bot actually sounds familiar to a lot of you. I know you must be thinking like, oh, this is like this will control bots very easy. No, not exactly. Yeah, it has something to do with controlling bots, but there is a twist. So there will be good bots and bad bots, isn't it? And AWS WAF bot control helps you manage bot activity to your site by categorizing and identifying common bots, verifying generally desirable bots and detecting high confidence signature of bots so that you can identify which are good and which are bad and allow or block requests based on that. And as it is written here, bot control primarily targets self-identifying non-targeted bots in order to give you the ability to monitor and control this category of bot traffic. So there are properties by which you can identify a bot. So some bot actually project themselves with information to make them trustworthy and some don't. But these properties are what makes bot control effective. But I don't want to confuse you right now. So if you're new and you might be thinking what is a bot and why is it called a bot? Let's talk about that. So a bot is nothing but a software or a program that runs automatic or automation tasks or scripts or programs over the internet. So you might have heard some people bragging about writing a bot that checks for a price of a commodity and if it's available in stock, it adds the product to the shipping cart. Yeah, it's nothing but a script. You can run it periodically to execute the task that you want. So the word bot comes from robot or web robot or internet robot. And there are times that you need to execute a task, but you want to perform that repeatedly. So in order to avoid the manual repetitive task, you automate it by using what we call as bots. And as I told you, bot is nothing but a software or a program that runs automation tasks or script or program over the internet. It will get your job done. But having said that, bot is a fancy name, but anything that you feel acts as per the instructions you provide, and it also seems interesting to others, that's what makes bots very popular among people. And there are good and bad bots as we spoke before. So good ones we have like web crawler bots for use for shopping. This is both good and bad. If you're trying to become a scalper, then that's bad. And we have chat bots that have predefined responses, information bots. They provide you details about places and dates or appointments. And obviously search engine bots like Google bot or Baidu bot or we have Bing bots as well. And the bad ones that we have here are like hackers and spammers and brute force login bots. Sorry. And we have the brute force login bots, which continuously pretend to be the user and try a brute force login with multiple attempts. So they do a hit and trial approach to find the password so they get access to the application that they want access to. But when you think in a way that you are a host, these bots can be a headache for you and they need to be controlled. The good ones should be allowed and the bad ones should be blocked. And as I already told you before, like there are ways we can detect the bot as mentioned here, like there are two primary sources of information required to identify a fake bot. The first one is HTTP header user agent and the second one is IP addresses. So if you have seen the request header of a request, basically it might give you the information about what browser is being used and fake bots can use something that is similar to popular browsing websites or sites like uh, using the same user agent string used by Google or Bing or Mozilla. So that they can so that they can pretend they are the good bots and ip addresses also we have so you can as well check the ip address and match it if it appears to come from a valid search engine provider network like google or mozilla or bing and if it does not then you can blacklist that so when we get a request from bot or the user the first contact point they have before getting the data from the web application is waf itself so as you can see in the diagram so using waf bot control you can effectively configure as per your requirement, you can specify 
default configurations to mitigate the bot that is the first point that you see that's configure next we have bot control where we actually detect the presence of the bots and the third thing is visibility now that you have configured and now you are able to detect the presence of bot you are able to control the flow and you can as well visualize and monitor the bot control activity by creating your own custom dashboards in cloudwatch as well so that's it but i know you would be thinking we haven't discussed any real-time architectures for bot control so let's do that so now let's see the architecture for identifying and blocking fake crawler bots using aws WAP. so before starting designing this or understanding the way we can identify the fake bots let's go back to something that we already discussed so remember there were two primary sources of information required to identify a fake bot so the first one was http header user agent and the second one was ip address so http header user agent if you have seen the request header of a request it might give you the information about what browser is being used and fake bots can use something that is similar to popular browsers like using the same user agent string used by google or bing or mozilla something like mozilla 5.0 and the machine it's being requested from and the google chrome version or even apple webkit so this information can be simulated from a real device and if this data resembles the one with google bot or bing bot then you can detect that it is a fake bot because it is trying to pretend to be a valid bot using the same strings used by the valid bots so next is ip address so you can as well check the address and match it if it appears to come from a valid search engine provider network like google or mozilla or bing so if you found the fake bot then we know the ip and we can store the ip and mark it as blacklisted so that we can ensure that the ip isn't allowed anymore so you can actually extract the client ip address for requests with the user agent set to one of the allowed bots and verify it so now that we have the solution let's implement it for a website that is hosted on a static web hosting by s3 so our main ingredients here are first obviously we will use waf2 which is the latest version of waf which was released in november 2019 we'll host our website in static website hosting with s3 with our cloudfront cdn giving access using oai or what we call as origin access identity so that you can see that in the lower half of the design so the easy request that you see here the waf v2 the cloudfront and the static website hosting that is where we'll host the website and for the real-time log streaming, we'll make use of Amazon AWS, Kinesis Firehose, and S3 to store them for analysis. So it will be stored on S3. And the Lambda function to capture the blacklisted fake bot IP address and to log information again to S3. So the next time it sends the request again, it will be restricted at the WAF level itself. And there are three points of attention here. So the first point is A, where we mitigate or detect the presence of a fake bot and allow only the good bots and get access to the content so that they can get access to the content. The idea you see here, so Lambda actually blocks fake bots by modifying WAF IP set config. This is where we test the IPs by setting them in the WAF IP config set or set config. This is just IPs, so don't worry about this and don't think much about this. And the point is we make use of Kinesis Firehose and store the logs on S3. And that's it. That's how you identify and mitigate fake bots. So when you get a good request like from the good bot like Google or Bing, you can validate it. And if it then you can then you can pass it forward to the CloudFront CDN, then it will get access to the S3 content or the website content. And if there is a fake bot and the request comes from a fake bot, then AWS WAF actually detects the presence of a uh, featured string that actually matches or is similar to what it is. and then what it does is it passes it on to the lambda function where it actually blocks the fake bots by modifying web by modifying web ip set config and then it is no longer allowed this next time you access the content it will no longer be allowed so that was interesting isn't it and we have covered a lot of topics and this is what makes aws WAF very useful so i hope you enjoyed the session that we had today if you did please make sure that you like the video it really helps the channel and if you're new you're most welcome and please do subscribe 
so that I get another chance from you to provide better content in the future. And if you also want to be a part of Hall of Fame members that uh, we have the list here, then please tag the channel with your certifications in LinkedIn or on LinkedIn with the channel name that we have by Holic YT. And if you would like to support this channel, please hit the like button, comment on what you liked and what you didn't, and please do subscribe if you haven't already. So stay safe, stay healthy. I'll meet you in the next session for AWS. Until next time, it's Pythholic signing off.